so it's good to be here tonight. It's good that you're here. Uh, it's good that the Lord's here. <laughs> um, going to get started here, but want to just encourage you to prepare your hearts for worship. Uh, as we uh, sing songs, you know, just welcome you to, you know, just sincerely connect with the Lord, you know, as you sing, or if you just, uh, maybe a song that you just want to pray and talk to the Lord and just let the, the words minister to your heart. Uh, just let, let's make this a connection and engagement with the Lord. Let's recognize his presence. Let's give him honor and just bring our hearts to him, all right? Experience the ministry of the Lord. Uh, a few things that I'll mention as we get started. Uh, ben and Tony, you know, they were in Kenya for the last couple weeks and they uh, arrived back in Tampa uh, today. Uh, so we're excited about that. So uh, Ben will be resting up and catching up and all those things. Uh, ask you to pray for Jose. Pastor Jose tomorrow's doing a memorial service in uh, Plant City. Uh, and um, uh, he was scheduled to teach tonight. So I like, you know, the, uh, the experienced pastor says, oh, well, I'll stop in for you. And now I'm scrambling at the last minute. Like, oh, no, I got to teach. Uh, but we're thankful for that. So pray for Jose tomorrow uh, as he's ministering to that family. Uh, and uh, just thankful for the opportunities to minister. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite the Lord to work. And as I do this, uh, maybe bow your heart. Bow your uh, heart to the Lord. Just invite the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's prepare our hearts to enter into his presence. Father, we thank you for these times. Lord, we know that you're always available to us. Uh, Lord, you've made a way for us. You're near the brokenhearted. You've promised us you never leave us alone. Uh, Lord, we are not orphaned. Uh, you're uh, ever near. You're always present. Uh, Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you that we can take moments like this as a fellowship, as a congregation, and sit before you. Lord, we thank you for the people here in this room tonight that have made time to do that. Lord, we thank you for those that are watching. Uh, online and, and maybe watching in the future, Lord. We pray for a work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to bring blessing to your heart. We want to bring uh, joy to your throne, Lord. So as we worship you, receive our praise, Lord. And as we uh, come before you, as we humble ourselves, Lord, be the lifter of our head. Would you encourage, uh, minister, share your compassion, your grace, your comfort, your mercy, uh, your peace with the hearts that are joining us right now. Lord, we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jen. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not Lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be the generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be the generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Sing, we bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. We turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols and give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be the generation that seeks, that seeks your face. 
Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, sing, we bow our hearts, we bend our knees. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols and give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation. Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Amen. I came across this song yesterday in the Psalms. And so I just want to invite you guys just tonight, let's just take a minute. And if you feel free or feel comfortable enough just to pray, and let's just ask the Lord that we would be those people that would be seeking Him tonight, tomorrow, with everything that's going on in the world. So. I just want to open it up, so don't feel like you have to, but if you feel, if you feel led, let's just ask the Lord to, to come meet us tonight. Lord, I just pray for my children. Lord, I pray that with all the challenges, Lord, all the distractions nowadays, Lord, technology, so many things, Lord, pulling at us. Lord, I pray that you would help them, Lord. I know that they know you as their Lord and Savior, but Lord, that they would be people that seek after you, Lord. Amen. If anybody else feels free, feel free out loud or feel free if you're not comfortable out loud, but... Sing the chorus again. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face. 
Oh God of Jacob, great is the measure of our Father's love. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end. They are new. Thy faithfulness, O oh Lord, oh great is thy faithfulness, O oh Lord, your tenderness melting all my bitterness, O oh Lord, I receive. Changing my unworthiness, O oh Lord, I receive your love. Oh Lord, I receive your love. Oh Lord, I receive. All my bitterness, O oh Lord, I receive your love. O oh Lord, your loveliness, changing my unworthiness, O oh Lord, I receive your love. I receive your love, your perfect love, O oh Lord. I receive your love. Sing, O oh Lord, I receive your love. O oh Lord, I receive your love. Oh Lord, I receive your love. Oh Lord, I receive your for this moment tonight Lord just to be together as brothers and sisters Lord meeting in your name Lord we receive your love tonight Lord your perfect love cast out fear Lord open our hearts to what you want to say Lord through bread tonight 
Lord, that it would go on good ground, Lord, and produce much fruit. And everybody said, amen. This is the part, I know you're not standing up, but this is the part where you greet one another. Be blessed. As we get situated uh, here, some reminders. Hey, we're coming to the end of July. It's crazy, man. The older you get, the time flies faster and faster. Uh, I think next week is communion. Isn't next week the last Wednesday of the month? So next week is communion. Uh, so you can be prepared for that. So we do communion on, uh, traditionally, Wednesday nights, last Wednesday of the month. So uh, next week's the last Wednesday of July. So communion next week. Uh, and then uh, uh, excited about that. So uh, heading into August. And as we head into, into August, just as I'm saying that, my son Joel will be back. So he's finishing up Zeal. He just got back from Costa Rica uh, in a mission trip to Costa Rica. So we're excited to have Joel back. So uh, you can be looking forward to seeing Joel very soon and uh, see him plug back in with the youth and, and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's been a blessing as well. See my son Ethan step in and uh, be a part of the work too. So thankful for him. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? I said Ben and Tony are back, uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, so they'll get reports soon. And uh, one more thing that you can uh, be praying for, a couple more things you can be praying for. Uh, you know, the needs of the fellowship remind you of those uh, people that are having some health issues. Uh, uh, some of the people are going through chemo. Bill Cook, uh, um, Loretta, uh, Tony is uh, Tony and Shirley. Uh, he's uh, struggling with uh, his cancer and uh, um, John Young who usually is up here heckling me uh, he's getting a um, I think he's getting a heart catheter is that right has anybody uh, so tomorrow tomorrow so keep him in prayer uh, he's been uh, having a lot of pain so we want him to receive care and, and healing and uh, have relief from that so keep John in prayer uh, lots of things like that going on I'm sure you have a lot of others uh, but uh, just things to keep you updated on. So um, uh, let's pray. Let's pray for our evening. Uh, let's just invite the Lord to speak to us through his word. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you again for the hearts here. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just open up your truth to us. That Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher, uh, that you give us ears to hear, uh, that you would lead us into all truth and be counselor and comforter. Uh, Lord, as we look at your word, Lord, we pray uh, that uh, you'd bless this time and that you'd be glorified. Uh, minister to the hearts here in Jesus name. Amen. Uh, one of the things too, as uh, we were getting situated here, you know, we uh, send out our video to the live stream online. And typically, uh, you can watch it on our app. Typically, you can go to YouTube. Uh, the feed that goes to our app is, a, is technically from YouTube. Tonight, YouTube's not working. And it's not our fault. Uh, yeah, it's just not working. But it is on Facebook. So uh, if you're ever in that situation, like right now, I'm talking to the people that are having problems getting online, but how are they going to hear me? It's one of those things, right? So if you happen to ever be in a situation where you're trying to watch us on our app and it's not working, try Facebook. Uh, sometimes things happen. YouTube's not working tonight, so our, our app's not working. Uh, but if you happen to talk to somebody, too, that we have a few people that watch online exclusively that can't get here. Uh, so if you ever hear that they're having problems, uh, encourage them to, you know, double check with Facebook, try the different options and alternatives. And when we can, we'll get it back up online, uh, you know, the archive of it later on. Yeah, Jose's got these, uh, again, work in progress, a chapter. The chapter that, you know, the, the, what I'm working on is, is uh, the topic of hope. Uh, and this chapter is uh, considering Rahab and the issue of hope. Uh, in Rahab's life, and there's some interesting things there. So you can read that later. Uh, don't read it now, because that would be hard on me, but you can read it later. We're doing the uh, series this summer, and we're having a, all the other guys are teaching. It's been a blessing. We are doing the series of Heroes of the Faith. Uh, and why don't we, you know, have Joshua chapter 2. Why don't we turn to Romans chapter, I'm sorry, not Romans, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, and just note uh, the heroes of the faith, right? The faith chapter, the hall of faith, as we've often called it. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, significant, famous chapter, uh, great chapter. Uh, 
not only gives us definition of faith at the beginning of this and encouragements on faith in Hebrews chapter 11, but it begins to list some of the Old Testament saints and some of their, you know, uh, just briefly, but some of the details of their story uh, and, uh, you know, why they are an example of faith and what they in their life experienced and what they did and the action of their faith. And uh, as you walk through this, it's, it's uh, you know, some of these names are the names that uh, we've been teaching through in our summer series, right? The Heroes of the Faith. As we're coming through this, we uh, recognize that, you know, we can't cover all of them during our summer series, but there's quite a few here, and we've covered some of them already. Uh, Moses and, and uh, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Elijah, uh, we're going to be covering more. Uh, tonight, I'm stepping in last minute, and I'm covering uh, Rahab, and you can go all the way in Hebrews chapter 11, you can go to verse uh, 30. Well, you can look at 30. Uh, verse 30 and 31 is where Rahab is brought up. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, uh, the harlot Rahab did not perish and those who did not, uh, with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Uh, just a, you know, an amazing little reminder of this moment. First of all, this chapter of faith, this listing of faith, this inventory of people of faith, you get to verse 30, and here's this moment of faith, and nobody's mentioned, right? By faith, the walls fell. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the collective, it's the nation of, it's the tribes collectively marching around Jericho, and the walls fall, you know, famous story, that, you know, Sunday school, we all heard the story, and uh, reminded of even an archaeological ruin, evidence of it, right? The, the reminder of that. And in the midst of that, this woman, right? And uh, Rahab, uh, she by faith does not perish. And what, what a great line, right? By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish. That's a, a great uh, uh, moment of faith, right? When the Walls of Jericho collapse. Rahab uh, had a trust in God. It's, it's uh, a unique, it's an amazing picture, right? This, this moment of God's grace, uh, Rahab trusts the Lord, and she doesn't perish uh, like those who did not believe. Uh, there's a lot of uh, typology in this, right? It not only speaks to us the true story of Rahab and her experience of trusting God, but it also points to that picture of believers, right? Us, the, uh, the believers in faith, the believers in Christ, uh, the redeeming blood of Christ and what he did for us. It's, it's uh, interesting, even in our, our worship tonight, there's little lines of our songs tonight that, uh, and, and not planned or purposed, but just, you know, those reminders as you're singing in, in, in here, the coincid coincidences of God, right? There is no such thing. There's not, it's not a kosher word that uh, the songs we sang spoke about the one that, uh, the, the sea parter, right? The one that parts the Red Sea. Uh, we sang about that a moment. And the other thing that we talked about was God's love melting our hearts. And what you're going to find is that uh, hearts were melted in Jericho, uh, but Rahab's heart was melted in a unique way. Uh, uh, just an amazing picture here. Now, uh, as we uh, have that, uh, you're in the New Testament, so let's go ahead and just look at another uh, passage here in the New Testament. Uh, let me find it quickly here, it's just on the top of my head, just thinking of it. And as I uh, turn and locate this passage, I want to say one thing, uh, just a factual thing of um, uh, Rahab. Uh, in the Old Testament, her name mentioned throughout the Old Testament, uh, she's mentioned three times in the New Testament, and we'll pay attention to that as we study tonight. Um, but as we... Uh, as we um, look through the Old Testament, as you're reading through the Old Testament, you, you'll run into the name Rahab, and it's kind of like uh, uh, you read it, and it sounds like she's in trouble. She's not, you know, that Rahab name. She's, there's moments where in the Psalms or in the, uh, some of the prophets where she's, that name is mentioned, and it seems like she's being judged for her pride and for her arrogance. Uh, interestingly here, now as you're reading through, uh, the word for Rahab, uh, that you see where there's Rahab receiving judgment, uh, that's a different word. It's not the same word as Rahab, the character, the woman that we're talking about tonight. 
So as you're a student of the word, as you're reading through the word, as you're uh, going through the word, you might want to be reminded of that, uh, that as you read through Psalms, as you read through the prophets, you might see the name Rahab. It's not uh, a, the proper name of the woman that we're talking about. It's a completely different way. It's very close in the spelling. And for some reason, the Hebrew word, that's a different word. Uh, when they translated it into the English, they translated it the same exact way, Rahab. I'm not exactly sure. It's probably because the English language doesn't handle the letters well, but it, it's a different word. There's a word that uh, is descriptive of pride and arrogance uh, and those things, and it speaks of figuratively of Egypt. Uh, it speaks of judgment. It speaks of God bringing judgment on that arrogance and on that pride. The word for the name Rahab is a different Hebrew word, and it means uh, wide, spacious, expanse, uh, and it's, again, it's a completely different word. So as you're reading through Old Testament, there's only a few places, uh, specifically in Joshua, where you see the name Rahab, and then you see her name in the New Testament as well. And other places in the Old Testament, when you see Rahab, that's a different word. Uh, so just be mindful of that as you're reading through. A uh, little um, uh, cleanup there so that you have clarity on that. Now, off the top of my head, uh, I'm not thinking of the, I'm not finding the verse that I wanted to look for. Um, maybe you can help me out. I found it. All right. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, uh, prophetically, uh, these, Matthew, famous at, at this, uh, Matthew does this a lot. He brings these, uh, uh, verses to us from the Old Testament. Uh, and he, here, Old Testament quotes, he's bringing it together, uh, and it says uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. Uh, the descriptive prophecies describing who Jesus will be, who the Messiah will be, this is... Uh, you know, the character of Christ, the character of Messiah, he's going to be one uh, that doesn't break a bruised reed. We've talked about this verse a lot because I think it's very important for us to understand the character of the Messiah, Jesus. And in this verse, this description, again, a prophecy speaking about who, what he would be like, and we see him fulfill this, a bruised reed in that culture in that day, a reed, uh, the importance of a reed or the value of a reed, the effectiveness of a reed was, would be its strength. You could make a flute out of it, uh, very often a flute, other things, but the importance was that it wasn't bent over or weak or bruised. If it was weak or bruised, it would be worthless, useless. And so the typical thing to do would be to throw it away. Can't use that one. Can't fix that one. It's, it's no good for nothing. Right, sorry for the English there, but that's the sense. Uh, but Jesus is going to come along and he's going to do something really out of the norm, right? Different than everybody else. He's going to come along and he's not going to throw away that broken reed. Important, right? In his character. The next thing, uh, emphasizing, and Hebrew poetry does this, gives you an image, gives you wording, uh, you stop and you think about it, and then it kind of restates it, rephrases it, and you're looking at the same idea, maybe in different light or different wording or different example. Here's a different example. It says here that a smoking uh, flax, uh, he will not quench. And the idea here of the olive oil lamps, right, that they would use back then, the, uh, the olive oil burning in that wick that would come out of that olive oil lamp would be a flax or a linen. Uh, same thing, that they would make this uh, out of flax. They would make their linen out of flax, linen seed, uh, and they would uh, burn that like a wick. And when that wick was burned out in, in, you know, no longer giving light, you would throw it away. There's not, nothing you could do. It's done. It's finished. It's burned out, right? Uh, it's like, uh, for us, a candle, right? When that wick is finally done, there's no more light that it can give, and it's, it's not useful anymore. You throw that out. You can't fix it. You can't you, got, you have to get a new one, right? And that's the sense. Here, Jesus is going to come along, and he's going to be the Messiah, a type of Messiah. The, a, his character, his nature, his way, is he's going to come along, and what the world would throw away, what the world would deem or conclude is broken, uh, uh, 
unrepairable, unreplaceable, right? All those kind of things. They would just get rid of it. And we have so much about, uh, about that in our culture today. We're a throwaway culture. We so often have a, you know, these things that are one use and done. Uh, and we, we're just, you know, tear it down and start over. And, and just, just especially in America. Right? And, that, and that culture or, or that practice and just in little things begins to affect us and, uh, and, and the way we treat people. Uh, Jesus would step into our culture today and there's so many things that we just get rid of, throw it away, we're done. Uh, and it affects us culturally that we're, we're that way with people. And see, that's the implication here is that Jesus doesn't do that and Jesus isn't like that with people. Bruised and broken, burned up, can't fix them, uh, you know, that kind of feeling of no good for nothing. Do you ever feel that way about yourself? Or, you know, and you feel like, or you feel like the world is done with you. You feel like you can't do, you can't, you feel like you can't do anything. Jesus comes along and, and by his redeeming grace, through the mercy of Christ, there is brand new, right? He, he, the born again experience, the work of Christ, is he takes that which the world would throw away, get rid of, uh, that which the world would deem as finished, no good for nothing. Jesus comes along and by his grace, he gives new life. And, and he not only redeems and repairs and restores, but he brings us to a place uh, out of that brokenness, he brings us to a place of restoration where now we have brand new potential in Christ. That's who he is. That's the hand of God, right? That's the heart of the Father even. Uh, that's why he sent his son, because that's who he is. He makes all things new. Well, perfect story to express that back in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 2, Rahab. <laughs> now, we enter into this scene. If you're familiar with the story of Joshua, Joshua has recently received the mantle of leadership. If you're familiar, Joshua chapter 1 is a great chapter, right? One of the first uh, sections of scripture that I recall memorizing uh, Joshua chapter uh, 9, <laughs> I'm sorry, verse 1. I'm talking, gosh, I'm stuttering here. Joshua chapter 1, uh, verse 9. In fact, verse 8 and 9, first, one of the, some of the first verses I remember memorizing myself. And just a powerful chapter. Moses, your, the servant of the Lord, Moses has died. Joshua steps up, right? God selects Joshua to take the leadership, the mantle of leadership. Uh, God tells Joshua at the beginning of this uh, call, uh, this moment, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you, right? Be strong, be courageous. These great encouragements, right? Uh, Joshua chapter 1, important chapter, you should read it. Part of the typology of this, right, the picture, uh, that you, the symbolizing that you see here that speaks of the Messiah to come, Joshua is that a foreshadowing of the Messiah, and part of that foreshadowing of the Messiah is the simple picture that Moses does not lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He brings them to the border, and God takes them home, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, all the things of God's grace. Moses does not enter to the promised land, and Moses is that representative of the law, right? And the law cannot bring you into the promised land. But grace can. And when you look at the name Joshua, Joshua uh, in the Hebrew is the, the name Yeshua. Uh, and uh, as you look at this name Yeshua, you bring that name Yeshua into the Greek. And when they translate it into the Greek, uh, and we bring it into our English, the name we have is Jesus. Uh, so when you look at this, Jesus' name in the Hebrew is Yeshua. And the picture here, fulfilled by Christ, is that Jesus, Yeshua, uh, not the law, but Yeshua is the one that leads the people into the promised land, right? It's just important, the grace. Uh, and if you're worried about Moses and all the hard work that Moses uh, did and that he doesn't get to go to the promised land, just remind yourself the Mount of Transfiguration. We just studied it, and grace brings Moses. There he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses is in the promised land, but it's by grace. It's by Jesus, 
All right, so this picture here, that the law, Moses representing the law, he doesn't bring the children of Israel into the promised land, but Joshua does. Uh, their first conquest is going to be Jericho. Now, we're not going to look purely at the battle of Jericho, uh, which is a, an amazing story, right? The, you know, surrounding Jericho, marching around, and all the things that they do, and uh, by God's miraculous power, uh, you know, not with uh, the scheming or strategies of the military or, or the, uh, the warfare aspect. It's not what Joshua and the armies do. It's Jesus. It's God bringing down uh, the walls of Jericho, right? And so it's just this amazing story. But in the midst of this story, there's a person. Uh, there's a woman. Uh, there's a, a harlot named Rahab. Uh, and we're going to pick up and focus in on Rahab. So in chapter 2, as they come to Jericho... It's well known for its fortified walls. Nobody can conquer Jericho, right? Now that's the sense. And here comes Joshua, and Joshua is going to bring it down with the blowing of trumpets, right? And the faith of the people, uh, as we noted in Hebrews chapter 11, it was by faith that the walls fell. So we're in chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, or in the Hebrew, Noon, uh, the son of Noon, uh, sent out two men from Acacia, uh, from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Forty years prior, Moses brings the children of Israel to the promised land. He sends in how many spies? Twelve, one from each tribe. Uh, they go in, right, or representing each tribe. Right? They, they go in, ten come back with a bad report. Two come back with faith. Joshua and Caleb, uh, and interestingly to note, uh, Jose is going to, you know, Lord willing, his schedule, he was scheduled tonight to do Caleb, but we'll reschedule that for days to come. Um, Jim, Pastor Jim, has selected to teach on Joshua, uh, so it's just amazing, right, this little section of faith, this little story here of coming into the promised land, this whole experience, we've already focused on Moses, Jim's going to teach on Joshua. Uh, Jose's going to teach on Caleb in the days to come. And here tonight, I'm talking on Rahab. Out of this story, four giants of the faith step forward. That's just amazing. Out of this story. All right, so Joshua already learned the lesson that, you know, we don't need to sell, send 12. Right? You know, and what, all the, the reasons why we could come up with. But Joshua says, uh, we're not sending in 12 this time. Two. Two is plenty. Uh, two was enough last time. Caleb and Joshua had good report. They trusted the Lord was going to be with them. Uh, the 10 were fearful. Uh, we're not sending that many. He sends two. Right? And, we're, you know, you just sense that about Joshua. It doesn't come out and directly tell us, but you can just see Joshua learned that lesson, and he's like, all right, we're going to send two to check out the land. So the verse continues. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Now, a couple things about this lady. First of all, uh, there are those that try to sanitize this and clean it up and just say she was an innkeeper. That's what she was. Uh, but that's not the word. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, and for the sake of the audience, you guys know that word, right? Uh, as you look at that word, when you go to the New Testament, remember we just read it uh, in Hebrew, uh, in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, the Greek, it says the harlot, Rahab. It says it in James chapter 2 as well. Uh, so her description is that. It's not what we would imagine today, though. And so we want to kind of bring it. It's not the extreme where we're going to sanitize it and make her just into an innkeeper. But at the same time, it's not like what we would know today. Right? There's something in the midst, middle of this. And so in that culture, in that time, a lot of this was wrapped up in pagan worship. Uh, in Jericho, archaeology has shown us that they worshiped the goddess uh, Ashtaroth. And uh, the worship of that, very sensual and pagan. Uh, so a lot of that was centered around false worship. Uh, but also in that culture, there is a sense here that uh, her household would have kind of, you know, it's not a perfect example, but it, the idea of it being kind of a, an inn for travelers, a, a, the local hangout, the, uh, the pub, the, the, you know, the old English pubs that were not just a pub, but that had all the, you know, 
things going on there, uh, but as well that people would stay. It was like an inn, right? The, it's probably, you know, the, the, the precursor to that kind of old English pub experience. And so it would have been natural. These guys are coming to study out the land. Where are they going to go? They're going to go to this spot because, first of all, there's lodging. Second of all, there's guys that we can talk to. We can get information. It's the place that you go, right? And so here they are with uh, Rahab the harlot. And as we read through this, you'll, you'll just sense her heart in this and how uh, God's uh, you know, grace is just pouring through this story. Um, as we continue, it says, verse 2, And it was told that the, uh, the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come, tonight, uh, or have come here tonight uh, from the children of Israel to search out the country. Uh, again, the, the pub would have been you know, filled up with guys type of thing, you know, that uh, it, it was a common place to go, right? Uh, I should say Rahab's house, but that kind of sense, right? Uh, it was the public spot. And so it's a place to get information. It's a place to get a room, but it's also a place where they're seen. And they get report back to the king. You know what? Some Jewish guys are here, right? Some Israelis are here. Uh, you know why they're here, king, right? So as you stop in the moment, uh, remember that at this point, uh, the children of Israel have been wandering through that desert, that wilderness area, for 40 years. If you ever look at the, the map of their wanderings, it's kind of like this, you know, th throwback here. But you ever read Family Circus and when the little boy was sent out on a journey and the, and the map would go all over, right? And it's just this crazy wandering spaghetti of how he went. That's almost like the children of Israel. They're in the wilderness wanderings. They're all over the place. And it's well known. And at that point... Uh, not only is there manna falling from the sky every morning, the reports of that have got to be getting out, right? Uh, but there's a pillar of smoke that covers them during the day, the heat of the day. And then there's a fiery pillar that, that lights up the sky at night, uh, for, uh, resting upon the tabernacle, the holy of holies, right? The presence of God represented in that. And so you got to imagine that the people around that area that are watching this, who are these people? What is going on? You know, it's like, you know, and they see this fiery pillar at night. And at this point, commentators, scholars estimate that the numbers of Jewish people, Israelites, in the wilderness wanderings is anywhere from two to three million people. And they also have their herds with them, right? They're goats and sheeps, sheep, 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 sheep whatever. Anyways, you know, how big is that cloud of smoke to cover the people? How big does that have to be? Right? How big is that fiery pillar at night that lights up the camp and is protective for the camp? How big would that have to be? I mean, it's not like a little candle. It's not like a big lighter, right? It's like this giant flame. You've got to imagine the word is spreading. Not only that, but the, 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 the uh, defeat of the Egyptians and uh, you know, the miraculous things, the world-dominating empire of that day, uh, uh, of that territory, uh, wiped out, right? The stories are spreading fast. And so now they just crossed the Dor Jordan. Now they're camping out right in front of Jericho. <laughs> and you know the king's knocking in his boots, right? You know his knees are wobbling. And he's got report out anybody that can give me information on what's going on. There's probably some reward there, right? And so the king is nervous. The, the people are nervous. People are afraid. You, you, you have to imagine that. Uh, that's a large army out there. What's going on? We know what they did to Egypt. And so at that moment, you come to verse 3, and you sense the atmosphere of this. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying... Bring out the men who came to you, who have come to you, uh, who have entered your house, uh, for they have come to search out all the country. And then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as, uh, as the gate was being shut. When it was dark, uh, they, that the men went out. Uh, where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, uh, for uh, you may overtake them. But, verse 6, she had uh, brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order uh, on the roof. 
Then the men, the king's men, pursued them by the road to the Jordan, uh, to the fords. Uh, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. And so they were uh, on a wild goose chase, right? The, uh, she uh, didn't tell the king that the men were up on a roof hiding behind the flocks of stack, uh, uh, the flax, stalks of flax. Uh, but uh, she told them they went out, they left, and the king chases them. He sends his men after them, and they're on a wild goose chase. They don't know. Now, interestingly enough, as you look at this, this imagery of uh, her having stalks of flax, uh, they would have been about two to three feet high, uh, and they um, create, uh, you know, we have flaxseed oil today, you know, that stuff the healthy people try to drink, get you to drink. Uh, uh, you know, that, uh, same thing. They made, not only did they... Uh, uh, have the you know the, the harvest of that, but they would make ropes out of that. They would end up making linen out of that. That was the main purposes of flax, was rope and linen. And uh, as you note that this woman uh, was had them up on her roof uh, and drying out, uh, and and obviously part of, part of her effort and her income was this uh, agricultural aspect. Now, as you look at that, you note this is not easy work. Uh, there's likely something having to do with her family, uh, but they had, it wasn't just you know that she was down and out and desperate and being a harlot. No, there was something, and maybe she's even trying to work out away from that, but she's uh, a woman that is working hard, and can you imagine uh, carrying out these stalks of flax up to her roof? Right? and being a part of that process. It's hard work is what I'm trying to say. And, and as you remember the, the image of the Proverbs 31 woman, uh, in Proverbs 31, that description of this woman and uh, her um, uh, business, you know, her, her uh, efforts, her talents, her hard work, and uh, how she, you know, the, just this perfect image of a, of a righteous woman, right? And all that, her hard work of her hands, and it specifically mentions the same thing, working with stalks of flax. And so there's just something of a hint of this, of the character of Rahab. Uh, there's something in her heart happening. There's, there's a heart of integrity. There's a heart of hard work that's coming through here uh, and might be overlooked, might be missed, but it's brought out in the story. And, and it's just evident that God writing this down, uh, the hand of the Holy Spirit bringing this to us, uh, through uh, you know the story of Joshua, there's something about this woman, right? She's willing to hide the men. She's willing. She steps out, and as Hebrews tells us, in faith she steps out. She helps out, right? She her action, her faith takes action. Uh, she's a hard work working woman, right? And as we move down, as they're hiding, and the king's men leave, and they go running after you know this wild goose chase. Uh, it continues in verse 8. It says, Now, uh, before they lay down, she came up uh, to them on the roof and said to, them, to the men, I know that the Lord has given you, given you the land, uh, that the terror of you has fallen on us, uh, and all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites uh, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there, there remain any courage, any courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, Swear to me by the Lord, since I have sh shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a, tr a, a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all uh, that they have uh, and deliver our lives from death. So, right, here's Rahab's conversation, her testimony. Right? You read this, and you, you recognize that, you know, the words that she uses and the ways that she speaks about God, it's just it's amazing. Right? Here's a woman in Jericho. Here's a, a city wrapped up in false worship, worshiping a false god, uh, and here they begin to have the testimonies of 
what God's doing for Israel come into the city. And this woman in her household and the men that uh, she speaks with and the people that come through and uh, the business that she runs and the hardworking agricultural aspect of it, all these kind of things, uh, and the people are talking. And what they're talking about is a conversation that has been rumbling for 40 years. Remember that. The children of Israel come out of Egypt, the Exodus. God delivers them. Uh, the Red Sea parting, right? That amazing, miraculous story. But then they don't have the faith to go into the promised land. So for 40 years after the Red Sea parting, they're wandering in the desert, right? For 40 years. And that generation passes away. And the next generation is the, is the one that comes through the Jordan and sits there outside of Jericho tonight, on this night with Rahab. Forty years have passed, and she says, look again uh, at the words uh, of verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out 40 years ago. She might not have even been alive. She grew up hearing the stories. Now the, the uh, destruction of uh, Sion on the other side of Jordan, Og and Sion, uh, there in verse uh, 10, at the end of verse 10, that happened more recently. So recent things have happened uh, and things happening 40 years ago, right? And, and likely a lot of the things in between, the fiery pillar, the cloud of smoke, the manna during the day, you know, the things that people had witnessed, uh, people watching the, the Israelites wandering through the desert, p stories, testimonies, and, and they're coming into Jericho and they're talking about it. And as soon as they heard about it, their hearts, they were faint-hearted, now, we don't have time to look at it, but I want to note that word in the Hebrew, that word faint-hearted. And you, as you read through this, you'll see it des descriptively explained. But that word faint-hearted means to melt. Their hearts melted. Now, the reason I bring that up is where you see that word earlier is when the Jewish people, when the Israelites, come through the Red Sea. God delivers them and destroys the Egyptian army there in the parting of the Red Sea and the closing of the Red Sea. Uh, just as miraculous, right? Uh, when they come through that, you remember that they sing the song of Moses, right? And Moses, you know, there on the other side, victorious. There they are. It's in Exodus uh, chapter 15. Uh, you can read it uh, uh, on your own later. But I want to point out one verse in that song. Moses' song, verse 15, says this. And the, then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them all the inhabitants of canaan will melt away moses's song right after the victory right after the red sea parting and closing uh, there on the banks of the red sea they sing this song moses the author it is prophetic and it is fulfilled here when rahab says we melted with fear as soon as we heard it Isn't that amazing And her confidence in this, right? As you read through this, for we have heard, right? And, and the, the, the things that she proclaims, uh, even prior to that, in verse 9, I know, right? Not maybe, we're hoping, we're thinking, we've heard, rumors telling us, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Right, the, this, this woman, uh, so sure, so confident, God's given you the land. Now, as you consider this and, and as you uh, read through this, uh, even as we note that she is, uh, her house, that she goes up on the roof to hide these guys, she goes up and talks to them on the roof. Uh, jumping ahead in the story, you can see that her house was part of the city wall, right? So that big, expansive wall. Uh, it's thought that the, you know, the, the way that that wall was structured in archaeology shows us this, that they would have an outer wall, and then they would have a large gap, and they would have an inner wall, and in between there would be rocks, boulders, debris, and so that wall was super thick uh, and strong, and then at the top of that wall, uh, they would, uh, you know, span that gap between the two walls and build houses on top of that, uh, and that's where she lived. And so just imagine, first of all, the view, <laughs> uh, the positioning, of these two spies looking over Jericho, 
from that position, right? They, they probably got a good lay of the land. Uh, but also think about uh, the knights that Rahab and maybe her family right there bringing up the stalks of flax and they're looking out across the Jordan and they see that fiery pillar. <laughs> and they think about God delivering the Israelites. Now, I want you to stop and think about how this would speak to Rahab through the years growing up with these stories and these truths, the real life events that are happening outside of their walls. And Rahab, this uh, harlot, this woman bound by those things, this woman uh, likely uh, on a, a, you know, in a difficult place, in a hard place, in a low place of that city of, Jer of Jericho, probably not treated the best, uh, probably uh, experiencing a lot of the abuse of that position and all those things that she's been through, uh, you know, not the high tier of the culture. Uh, and she hears that there's a God that sets slaves free. And she sees them wandering in the desert, and they're coming our way. And God has rescued the children of Israel. God has broken the chains of their bondage. God sets slaves free. And here Rahab, that those stories, that experience, and you know her family and the position of her family. And she probably grew up. You know, with similar, uh, you know, experience, you know, and maybe uh, relatives in the same business and the same experience and kind of in that position of hardship. And she grows up and, she, and they're not fairy tales. <laughs> she grows up and she hears these stories and they tell her what happened. And there's God of Israel that sets people free. And she w goes up to the roof at night and she sees that pillory pillar of fire at night and she knows it's true he's real and he's coming this way <laughs> see so you, you know <laughs> the moment of you know coincidence right that word again it so happens that she bumps into two jewish spies coming into her place <laughs> why did god pick jericho Right, why, why would God pick Jericho? Why would God bring down the walls of Jericho? Why would it be so important? And, and I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a stretch. I don't think this is hyperbole, exaggeration of any type. I think this is revealed in the heart of God throughout the text of Scripture, throughout the redemption story. Uh, numerous people experience this. I, I think that God comes to Jericho. I think God even brings down the walls of Jericho for Rahab. You know, and just, you know, pausing here in the moment of this, are there, are there any chains that are too big for him to break? Right? Is there any wall that would keep him from you? Right? In fact, you know, Paul tells the Corinthian church that we have been given uh, spiritual weapons and we can bring down strongholds. Right, spiritually speaking, just the, the authority that comes through this text. And you look at this and these walls of Jericho and the things that uh, would keep us from the Lord. Uh, you know, the, the sense of this isn't, isn't uh, centered on um, Rahab and her character. The sense of this is really it's centered on the heart of God and if, how far he would go, how much he would fight uh, for the heart of a woman like Rahab. And so we just, you apply that to your, to your own life, and you look at your own life, and is there anything in your life that's too hard for the Lord? Is there anything that would keep him from you? Is there anything that would separate you from his love? Well, Paul would tell the Romans uh, in the book of Romans chapter 8, there's nothing that separates you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and you see the image of that through this story. Uh, the walls of Jericho, uh, uh, legendary. <laughs> the reputation of the walls in Jericho uh, throughout the land. But it wouldn't keep God from reaching Rahab. And he washes over her heart night after night as she witnesses his glory and his grace through the children of Israel. And here, on this day, two Jewish spies come to her. <laughs> now, as she 
begs them, even kind of makes a deal with them, <laughs> right? It's kind of cute that she negotiates, right? <laughs> uh, she begs them to deliver her and her family, right? In verse 13. You know, so the, this, this heart that she has, deliver us, right? And, and you just that, those initial steps towards the grace of God and the deals that we'll make if God will forgive us, right? Just, just that, you know, naive in a bit, a, a bit but, uh, you know, just the, the, the compassion of the Lord and we can, we can see the, you know, maybe the naive, even the immature approach, but listen, God wants to rescue her. There's not a deal you have to make. And so the men, in uh, verse 14, these two spies, they say this. So the men answered her, our lives for yours, right? If you save us tonight, or you saved us tonight, so we'll save you. If none of you tell this business of ours, it shall be when the Lord has given us the land uh, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So here on this night where she takes action, right? Her faith, taking action, <laughs> Right? And she's so, it seems like she is so convinced. Uh, again, from you know, the way I'm relating this to you, this isn't an overnight flip of the switch. I think that God's been washing over her for years. And on this night, she knows with a strong assurance that the Lord has given you the land. And this moment of God sending forth these two men, I, again, intent of God, purposed of God. He sends them to meet this woman who has a, a, a heart ready, a faith, a heart of faith to take action. And God allows her to be that vessel that rescues these guys. And God's response is grace and mercy. Now, let's, uh, I don't want to step on the other guy's territory that we'll be teaching on Caleb and uh, on Joshua uh, on other nights as we go through our summer series. Uh, but let's just note this and connect some dots here. Forty years ago, the Red Sea is parted. Uh, the Jewish people are making a journey, and it'll just take a few weeks to come up to the Jordan, and they're ready to come across the, into the promised land, and God's ready to bring them. They send t t 12 spies, and two of those spies believe God will deliver this to us, Joshua and Caleb. But they're at the 10 respond in fear, and they say, well, there was just, they're we're like grasshoppers in their side. We're tiny. We're, there's no way. The fortified cities, they, we can't do this. It's insane. Right? And so the, the two to three million Jewish people on that night, when ten spies give bad report, they weep through the night. I can't handle one sniveling kid in the bedroom, right? You know, the ten, uh, it, it, ten spies give bad report, and two to three million Jewish people are weeping through the night. I would have, I would have, just, I would have just go nuts. Right, so that night, they respond in fear. But the reality is, you know, their, their emotions, their doubt, their fear, the anxiousness of their heart, uh, they respond that night in fear. They refuse to obey and follow the Lord in faith. But on that same night, you jump across from that scene, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Right? But you jump across from that scene, and you go to Jericho, and their hearts are melting with fear. Oh, man, what the, that, they missed it. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about that, right? That they didn't enter in, right? That, right, so Rahab lets these spies know, listen, all those years ago, we were melting with fear. You had us 40 years ago. So, you jump ahead 40 years, and now a new generation and two spies. And do you see the faith of these spies? I'm sure the confidence that they have has been reinforced by this, who's this lady who's willing to hide us? And look at how she's talking, and she's, the Lord's giving you the land. I know it. Right? Can you just imagine the spies in that moment going, what is this? this is amazing. Right? Remember when Gideon heard that dream and uh, gave him confidence to go against the Midianites? And, uh, you know, just those moments where God gives a dream, gives insight, gives understanding to a pagan. And these Jewish men that are following God hear this pagan woman say, I know that God's given you the land. Right? And their response is, uh, look at, again at verse uh, 14, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land. Not if, not maybe, we'll see. 
Now, when it happens, right, we'll deal kindly and truly with you. Uh, verse 15, then uh, she let down the rope. Uh, uh, she let them down by a rope through the window, uh, for her house was the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Go to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. All right, those guys on that wild goose chase, make sure you avoid them. After, afterward, you may go your way. And right, so God uses her and her understanding of the situation, and they are rescued by her. Now, the flax that she had on that roof, right, that's, again, they would, one of the great reasons they had flax was to make rope. That was one of the main things that they did. And so she had a rope. Uh, and as you read through this, we'll note this in a moment, but that rope, uh, and in, in the King James it says scarlet thread, uh, it's better to understand it as a cord, as a rope, uh, strong enough to hold two men, uh, but it's also scarlet. And in that area, they did have a, a dye trade where they would dye materials. And, and uh, so <clears throat> the fact that she had a full rope, uh, th you know, th this length of rope to let them down that was dyed red uh, shows you that she is a, a very astute businesswoman. <laughs> uh, she had some funds to have that, right? But what are the odds of two Jewish guys coming into this house and being let down, delivered, rescued by a Scarlet, not a yellow, not a green, not teal, <laughs> not striped, but scarlet rope. Hmm. Well, well, we'll read that and pick up on this. Verse uh, 17. So the men said to her, we will uh, be blameless uh, of uh, this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your, our, uh, to your own home, uh, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house uh, into the street, his blood shall not be on, uh, shall be, I'm sorry, shall be on his own head. It won't be our fault, right? This is the way to be saved and be rescued. Come to this house. Put that scarlet rope out the window, uh, and those in the household will be saved. Uh, and they will be, uh, his, uh, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood uh, shall be on our own head if, the, if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you've made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now, can you imagine the night that she goes to her family and says, okay, guys, listen. <laughs> and she tells them the story. Right? These two guys from Israel came in, right, and what... And, and here's how I helped them, and this is what happened. And I put a scarlet rope. And that scarlet rope, we made a deal. And here's the deal. Jericho's, the walls are going to fall. What? Can you imagine that moment where she's telling them this story? And honestly, we don't know the situation. Maybe uh, there are people that have raised her, her father, her mother, others. Maybe they've told her the stories and they've been waiting. Maybe their hearts have been crying out as well. Uh, maybe not. Maybe they're, you know clueless to those things and maybe they're thinking Rahab's nuts we knew it you know and all that stuff but can you, you just stop in the moment and recognize uh, we don't know how many came we're not told uh, you know that sense that you know did cousins come but as you read through this verse 22 uh, they departed and went to the mountain and stayed there three days the spies until the pursuers returned the pursuers uh, sought them all the, along the way but did not find them uh, so the two men returned, descended from the mountain, and crossed over, uh, and they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly, the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country uh, are faint-hearted because of us. Now, 
You know, in the book of Hebrews, we read it earlier, it says that Rahab, the harlot Rahab, did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Right? Her, uh, you know, the, just the image of her faith, the action of her faith, her faith displayed, not just a thought or an opinion she had in her heart, but she actually, her faith moved her to action. Sounds like James, right? Her faith moved her to action. Uh, her faith led to works, right? Uh, and true faith does that. True faith is decisive, right? True faith is bold. True faith steps out and moves you to action. And James speaks of Rahab as well, and he says this of Rahab in chapter 2, verse 25 of the book of James. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by her works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Uh, she was justified. <laughs> Rahab rescued. She does not perish, and she's justified. Uh, uh, an amazing story of faith, but it's also typology, and it speaks of, remember who led the children of Israel into the promised land? Yeshua, right? Remember the one that could bring them in? Uh, Joshua, right? right? That name that we have, the Messiah, uh, the same name of our Messiah, Jesus. Jesus brings us into the promised land, and you note this, the heart of faith trusting in the, the leadership, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, that you shall not perish and you will be justified. Right? Just an amazing image for us. Now, I think that uh, in this as well, uh, you know uh, this of Christians, those who have trusted Christ, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're the rescue squad. He sends us out on mission, <laughs> not too unlike the spies. And you know there's a Rahab on your path somewhere? And she might be one that the world would cast out and reject and refuse. Uh, haven't you ever looked at the people in church and wondered what their story is? Can I tell you that we're a bunch of misfits, a motley crew? He chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. Right? You, you just look at this, and not only is it that moment where you recognize we're all Rahab in a sense, right? Broken. <laughs> you, you recognize, again, we have a Messiah, that a bruised reed he will not cast out, and a smoking flax. And I, honestly, I think that that connects us back to Rahab uh, and the working of flax and linen and all those things. I think that brings us back to this. Uh, if there ever was a woman that was a broken reed, if there ever was a woman that was a, a smoldering, smoking flax that had been used up and burned out, it's her. But she hears that there's a God who rescues slaves and breaks chains. And she finds out he brings down walls, too. <laughs> really precisely because <laughs> he leaves her house standing so he can rescue her. I love the story of Rahab. But we're not done. Now some of you grab that little uh, work in progress, a chapter on hope that I, I'm working on. Uh, you can read that. There's a lot more in the Hebrew language that really speaks of the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, so you'll want to read that. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, that kind of stuff. And uh, if you have some red marks, you can make those too. Uh, but can I just bring you into, I think, the clincher of the story that just is stunning and amazing to me. Uh, can you turn to the uh, book of Matthew? And as you turn to the book of Matthew, can I just let you know uh, what happens here? Uh, Rahab is rescued. And Rahab marries a Jewish man. Jewish tradition tells us it was one of the spies. And as we find out that God's grace not only rescues her, but brings her into the family, right? The, just again, this story of grace depicting the grace that we've received as well, the adoption of grace, right? As you look at that, you know that she raised her family, and she has a son. She raised her son to know about <laughs> the God who rescues. 
and a God that doesn't discount the broken reed, the smoking flax, a God who doesn't dismiss or exclude a woman like her. And she would raise her son to know that grace and to know mercy and compassion. And her son would be Boaz. And Boaz would grow up and be a successful man, established in his family. And here comes a foreigner in need, destitute, desperate, a widow, a broken reed, a smoking flax. Uh, she would have been a rejected person in that culture. And Boaz sees her and finds out her name is Ruth. And he marries her. And he stands up in that whole story of Ruth, beautiful story of Ruth, and he is known as the kinsman redeemer. And it's again a beautiful typology of our Messiah, the kinsman redeemer, right? The the, the f familiar one, the family that would rescue, redeem. Boaz steps up as that, and Jesus fulfills that. And Boaz is that picture of uh, the kinsman redeemer stepping up and redeeming, rescuing a Gentile bride. <laughs> and the picture of that being the church, right? It's just a beautiful story. I was just amazed at that story. So here you are in Matthew chapter 1. And you see the genealogy of Matthew, right? And Matthew lists out the genealogy of Christ. And he goes through this, right, all the way through. And if you look at the last verse of Matthew chapter 1, right? Well, I'll read verse 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. And did not know her till she brought forth her firstborn son. His name is Jesus, right? Jesus. Well, if you look at the beginnings of that first chapter of Matthew, you have the listing of all those in his family tree. <laughs> and in that verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, uh, you have Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, the king. There's not a whole lot of ladies mentioned in this genealogy, Ruth being one of them, but uh, Rahab as well. And you look at that, and you recognize, wow, we have a God, this grace that brings in the broken, the hurting, the rejected, the refused, right? He brings them in, and a woman like Rahab, a woman like Ruth, brought into the tree of Jesus Christ, brought into the lineage, uh, brought into that, the story of Jesus, that scarlet thread of redemption runs through the whole story. Wow. Rahab, by faith. Wow, let's pray. Uh, as we pray, uh, you know, again, the reason that we're looking at these stories is so that we get to know God. We uh, read these stories, and Rahab is an amazing but, uh, story, and I, we love her, and it's just a, a great uh, drama, but at the same time, it shows us the heart of Jesus, right? The heart of our God and the love that he has for us. Uh, so tonight, uh, those areas of our lives that are broken, those things that we've been through, the things that we've done that seem unredeemable, unrepairable, what can God's grace do to start your story fresh and new? The hope of Rahab, the hope of the Messiah. All right, so by faith tonight, would you pray? <laughs> Just seek the Lord, and recognize who he is and who we are in his grace. I'm going to give you time to do that. Reflect, talk to the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to just confirm truth and bring it to your heart personally. Yeah, you seek the Lord, you talk to him.
Father, again, we thank you for bringing this story to the page and bringing it to us tonight. We thank you that you've maintained it and you've brought the truth of this story. And we can look out across the wall of our life and see your grace shining bright in the darkness of night. Lord, we can see how you've pursued Rahab and we know that you've pursued us. And there's nothing that would keep us from your love. No wall too strong, no wall too thick, too high. Lord, you, your love will reach us. You pursue us. Lord, we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, would you wash over our hearts in those areas of brokenness and hurt and even areas of sin. Lord, would you wash over us redeeming grace, restore us, rescue us, deliver us. Uh, and Lord, as you confirm and do that work in us, would you send us out? Maybe there's a broken vessel, a bruised reed, a smoldering flax. Maybe there's a Rahab along our path. And Lord, we just stop and we recognize you didn't have to go to Jericho, but you did. Lord, and just to uh, pause in your grace and recognize it was for Rahab. <laughs> Lord, maybe there is one like that on our path. Lord, would you fill us with a grace so strong, so sure, uh, and would you send us out? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, well, hey, you know, in closing, again, if you uh, wanted to grab that chapter, work in progress, uh, make sure you check with us. I think Jose passed them out. And let me know what you think. And as well, you ever heard anybody ever ask you about the man on the island and how's God going to reach, you know, you know, what if that guy never heard about it? Bring up the story of Rahab. <laughs> uh, God will reach the people whose hearts want to be reached, right? He reaches us. Well, have a great night experiencing the Lord. Hey, you know what, too? Hang out, fellowship. If you want prayer, make sure you grab somebody, pray with somebody. Uh, we're here to pray as well. And we got popsicles, right? So uh, hang with us, eat some popsicles, right? You got those, right? Hey, the popsicle people go to Calvary Chapel Crystal River. They do. And so we got popsicles from them. And they were here on Sunday, and I met them. And I didn't know they were the Popsicle people. I didn't get to say thanks, but yeah, they're... Yeah, so you can support them, eat some Popsicles, have some fellowship. It's summertime. Popsicles are needed. <laughs>